Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and I'm delighted to be back this Monday afternoon with Colin Watt. How was your weekend, pal? Yeah, good. Good weekend all round. Uh, the clock's going forward, makes it longer days. It's it's sunny in Greenock for a change, which is unbelievable. Um, so yeah, good weekend all round. Sunny in Greenock. Is that unusual, is it? Is that no normally oh, happen? So. Yeah, it's probably the wettest part of Scotland, I'd say. Oh, dearie me. Right, I'll tell you what, Colin, uh, we're not going to talk about the weather. There's plenty more to talk about here oh, on this uh, Monday it's afternoon. It's skies, it's beautiful. Oh, it's good. It puts a wee smile on your face, mate. I'll tell you what else puts a smile on my face. I'm going to start off with a proper positive here, right? This isn't meant to be plugging anything, but as anyone who tunes into a Celtic state of mind will know, we're on the road. We're doing live events. We're meeting new people. We're meeting new um, ex celts that we've maybe never spoken to before, and we're taking a Celtic state of mind out and onto the uh, onto the road and into the masses. Um, because during the, the lockdown, let's be honest, Colin, you kind of dreamed of getting out of the house and meeting fellow celts and all that, and um, I really missed that community aspect of it. And uh, obviously, you know, getting some of the ex celts on the stage is always a good laugh. So on Saturday night. Um, Peter Grant was in town for an audience with a Celtic State of Mind and it was fantastic. He stepped in for our pal Danny. Danny McGrain wasn't able to you know, uh, do the night, unfortunately. Peter, his ex-teammate, stepped in and done it. We're going to be talking about some of the stuff that Peter Grant actually covered because it was brilliant um, in equal measure. Funny, insightful and all the rest. And this gentleman came up to me, right? I didn't want to embarrass him because he doesn't... Um, he doesn't contribute in terms of the, the chat on the show, Colin, but he watches mm-hmm. the show and he was there with his girlfriend and he actually brought a gift along and he said, thank you for doing what you guys do. And he gave me the gift. Because I'm there, I get the gift, right? But it was for everybody, okay? <laughs> and he gave me the gift, Colin, and he explained that, you know, particularly, and I've heard a lot of this recently, particularly through the lockdown, this gave a lot of people out there a wee hour of Celtic chat, the community chat in the comment section. And he was so thankful, right, that he's popped in. And I'm going to show you this. He's popped in, right, to the Celtic shop. There you go. And bought us a wee gift. He noticed that I like to sit here with a wee cup of the old chi chai when I'm doing the bulletin. And he bought us a mug, a Celtic mug. So as oh, always, this week, I will be using this. Massive thank you. As I say, he doesn't want any credit. He even threw in some tablets. You must know that my biggest vice is the sweet stuff. So there you go. How brilliant is that? Honestly, I, it's unbelievable. random act of absolute kindness. Brilliant. Do you know, it's it's crazy. Like, I feel like I'm just talking to my pal on this. Like, me and you just sitting talking away, talking about Celtic. You sometimes forget that there's like thousands of people that watch this every mm-hmm. single day. Um, and then you go out and you're maybe out at a Celtic event or you're out at a game. And sometimes you're just out doing your shopping and you bump into people that uh, tell you how much they've watched the podcast and um, how much they enjoy it and stuff like that. Like on Friday night, we had Chris Sutton in Greenock. Uh, name dropping there is a big... You, a big you, you done it. Did I do it first? Aye, I dropped, name dropped <laughs> Peter Grant. Yeah. So. <laughs> you, you get Peter Grant, I'll up you with um, Chris Sutton. Um, and a couple of people came up saying how much they watched the, sh- the podcast and how much they watched it every day and uh, how much it meant to them. In fact, I've got something here. Hold on. Oh, here we go. Free gifts all round. It wasn't a gift. Is it's that a pair of Adidas Sambas? Oh, no. But uh, that's a proper sell like that, you know. Um, when I was in Madrid, uh, there was a gentleman that gave me this. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. All the way from Germany. Brilliant. So it just shows you how much like it's watched throughout the world as well. It's It's unbelievable. Um, and yeah, it's great to see. I mean, looking at some comments here, there's people in Australia, mm-hmm. even people as far and wide as Fort William. It's unbelievable. It's brilliant. And, and by the way, we're not saying this to big ourselves up. We're saying it because that kind of level of kindness uh, blows us away. And anybody that says to me about, oh, by the way, these were really important during the pandemic, I say back to them, but we needed that as well, Colin. We needed that yeah. during the pandemic um, to get us through it as well. It gave you a bit of structure and, as I say, a bit of community. And the programme we use, I'm just going to try this while I'm sitting here, the programme we use has got this new function. Look at that. We can move things a bit. Look at that. So see when we start bringing up wee pictures and stuff, I'm going to be able to move that 
and uh, shift it about and all that kind of stuff. So that should help us when we're bringing up some thing, graphics. Yeah. You like that? It's pretty nice. I didn't see anything. I don't know if you didn't. Was... Oh, did you know? All right. Uh, Maybe if I do it and then save it then, if I do that, right, Can it's not changing nothing, right? So what if I save it? Does that change it? No. I've not saved it yet. Does that change it? No. Okay, I'll I'll keep working on that, right? <laughs> because I do want to bring up some graphics er, er, later on. Um, a pal of mine was telling me that there is a, a missing person at the moment, and uh, we will be showing his picture to hopefully um, assist with any inquiries because his family are getting really worried. He's a Celtic fan who may be known by some of the people that tune into the show, so we'll be doing that as well. Now, you actually just reminded me there by mentioning Chris Sutton, and this is bizarre how football works. Granty was telling us, I'm just going to call him Granty as if he's my mate. Oh, Granty, yeah, Granty oh, was yeah. telling us that um, he eventually left Celtic for Norwich, as we know. But five years before then, Norwich approached Celtic to sign Peter Grant. And had he signed at that time, he would have played alongside Chris Sutton. It's bizarre, that, isn't it? Because um, obviously Sutton was a goal scorer coming through at Norwich. He, he was a centre half stroke centre forward. Yeah. And uh, Norwich had that great European run, you might notice, uh, remember from the early 90s. By the minute, yeah, Jeremy Goss, Chris Sutton, all that kind of era of players. Uh, we'll come back to that. We want to be talking about um, the tagline. And I, I, I read the comment section both through the live and also afterwards, Colin. And a few people said that. Um, going with taglines like this is uh, not fitting in terms of being a Celtic fan because it's too boastful, or too arrogant, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted to get that out there. It's not a case of that. It's a case of looking at where we are as a football club right now um, and where everybody else is in Scotland and how we have got everything um, so solid and the foundation so solid in so many different ways. So we're going to be talking about that as well, that it may result and Celtic uh, being where we are in terms of domestic football, certainly, for a whole generation. Um, and also what I mean by that, Colin, since you started watching Celtic, we've been on top. And I mean, as a mm -hmm. fan going to the games, yeah. generally speaking, we've been on top. We've not won every league, but we have won the vast majority of the leagues during your Celtic support in life. So in your generation, we have been a dominant force, and I mm -hmm. think we can do it for another generation. Um, how hard is it for yourself when Celtic don't win the league? Because it's it's not happened that that often in, in your lifetime, let's be honest. Yeah, it, it is quite strange. Obviously, being born during the nine-in-a-row era um, that they had, it makes it a lot easier now when you look at it because you're too young to know what was going on. But like mm. speaking to my uncle's pals and stuff like that that I go to the games with, and how they went and seen Celtic playing for maybe nine, ten years without winning a trophy. It's it's crazy. Um, if you think, like, I've seen Celtic at the most successful. My younger brother, I mean, he you miss out the sort of Walter Smith era and you miss out the uh, the sort of odd title here and there. He's probably only ever seen Rangers win one or two titles. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's coming up for 20, so... That just kind of shows you the, the dominance that Celtic have had over this period. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not about bigging Celtic up to an extent or sort of being boastful. It's actually reflecting on the hard work that's been done by the team, not just behind the scenes, uh, but on the park, and also the support that the fan base have given, because... We think back to the early days of Ange Postacoglu and there was certain fans that after maybe six or seven games were like, this is a failed experiment. Um, it was the same when you're sort of picking up the stuff that was in the press about how he didn't have his UEFA Pro licence and this and that and the next thing. Um, and it's all about sort of patience and being there. And sometimes that patience is sort of lost on the Celtic support. If you go back to the likes of um, the Hibs game the other week. We're mm -hmm. 1-0 down, coming up for half-time, and the fans start getting on the players' backs and uh, really sort of having a go at them for being wasteful or not moving quick enough and not upping the pace. And the one thing that you learn about watching Celtic, especially under Ange Postacoglu, is that patience, because it pays off eventually. 
Yeah. Um, there's never really been a time where Celtic have been patient and they haven't got the rewards for it, especially under Ange Postacoglu. You'd have to go back quite a while and probably when you're talking back to that nine in a row period where Celtic fans were patient, they stuck by the team. And eventually when Mum Jansen comes in, that's when their patience has paid off. But for a long, long time, Celtic had to be patient. And it's something that we need to continue to be as a, a football club. Success isn't just going to be found there right like immediately. The, the foundations will keep us going for a long, long time. You know this, Colin, right? Um, I think that there sometimes is the Celtic da, you've already mentioned it, this is the second <laughs> time we've mentioned that term this uh, afternoon. That term is often used for people like myself and people of a, an older generation who might have seen the, the real bad time in modern football in terms of Celtic, which was the 1990s, right? Um, you probably have to go back, in fact, no probably about it, you have to go back to the 50s. Uh, to realise such a, a dearth of success. The problem in the 1990s was that we were also really uh, financially strapped and that all unravelled almost in spectacular motion until Ferguson and his team came in and saved the day, right? Um, however, I'm not saying it so that it's a, you know, you should be thankful. I'm just saying that there are actually positives from your generation knowing nothing but success. And that's that that's all you're going to accept. And I don't see that as a bad thing, right? I just think that that sets a standard. It's not an entitlement. And as long as everybody realises the hard work that goes into it and realises it's not an entitlement, that that is the standard of Celtic Football Club, not only within the fan base, but <clears throat> through a period of domination and success, it becomes a culture within the club. And then anything that drops below that standard is not accepted. And that's what you'd rather have. You'd rather be the, the premier club. You'd rather be the one that everyone wants to come and try and knock off their perch. Mm -hmm. um, when you, you listen to Ange Postacoglu, right from the word go, the we never stop mantra, when you listen to what that um, sort of speech really was, it was about starting the game, getting in their faces, not stopping, and the only time you stop to celebrate is when you score a goal or when you're celebrating at the end of the game. Now, there was a few F-bombs in there as well, though, Colin. There was, but it. it's, I mean, it's a lunchtime show. We don't want to put a lot of people off. Um, but the, the idea behind that is he's instantly telling the players all he's going to accept is success. That is all he is going to accept. Mm -hmm. And the fans are kind of like that as well, that all they'll accept is success. Even you go back to the period of sort of the Ronnie Dial era. Now... That isn't the worst football we've ever seen. Some of it was very entertaining. I think back to the performance against Dundee United um, in the early part of his spell. I think it was like 6-0, six, 6-1, six six something like that. Um, in six the two. It was 6-2, wasn't it? Was that when Inga Bergett scored yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. of goals? Yeah, 6-2, yeah. I think it was. I mean, that was a really, really exciting time to watch Celtic. There was some really good football being played. But then you see things like the odd result here and there that didn't go our way. Um, performances that weren't quite up to that standard. And we know the reasons behind that. We don't have to go into detail about it. But the demand was for success. And we did win a lot of trophies in that period. Three trophies in two years is impressive, considering there is only three to really to play for in Scotland. But even that wasn't enough. And then you look at the invincible treble the following season the success that you have under Brendan Rodgers, the continued success you have under Neil Lennon, mm. to the point of where when you have one bad season, the standards have slipped. And Celtic fans know when the standards have slipped. You go back to that close, behind closed door season, we knew early on when the standards had slipped. A lot of people would say, oh, you've got to give them time to turn it round. Celtic fans know. that they're, they're very, very intelligent. They know when things aren't up to the standard that's been set by the club. And when things like that happen, they're very quick to voice their opinions. Mm -hmm. But as I say, patience is massive. And for those in my era, it be I can understand why there isn't a lot. As you say, you've got to go back to what the fifties before the the nineties. It's two two decades out of the last near eighty odd years. And by the way, I wasn't there the first time round, mate. I seen the nineties, sure? no the fifties. Sure? Yes, sure? I'm sure. <laughs> by the way, the the new layout does work. Watch. 
you can do it like right. that. Oh, next one. Um, but we will use it just to bring in some graphics. As I was saying before, uh, Pally Mine came in uh, earlier on today and shared the following with us. So let's bring it up, right? Because this is important. And obviously, there might be somebody out there um, who knows this individual. And, you know, throughout this actual broadcast, if indeed Evan Reed does show up, then apologies uh, in advance. I did check before we went live and. You know, he was a missing person at that stage. So we've got his uh, details up on the screen here. And often, uh, more often than not, on a Monday, our show um, after the live and, and during the evening, and then once our Australian viewers come in as well, a lot of them call in and overseas viewers will be seen by about 10,000 set size on YouTube, a couple of thousand on Twitter. Uh, we'll also have the audio, which goes out again. So over the piece, we're 20 five to thirty thousand a day across loads of different platforms and you just never know somebody might might know something that will assist uh the police in their investigation evan reed 31 years old i'm going to read this out for the benefit of those listening on the audio platforms later on as well last seen at around 21 40 hours on the 25th of march 2023 in paisley evan is described as around five foot eight tall slim build with short brown hair and um, evan was known to be wearing a khaki green jumper black body warmer dark blue jeans and gray trainers it's thought that evan may be within the paisley area and anyone with information on his whereabouts please contact 101 and here's the reference this is the incident number it's 4112 of the 25th of the third 23 so it was incident number 4112 of the 25th of march if you've got any information call up and share that. And as I say, if Evan is found during the next 45 minutes or so, brilliant. And I apologise if, if uh, this has already been resolved. But any information at all, um, get it out there and contact 101. And hopefully, Evan will return to his family very, very soon because they are pretty worried at the moment, Colin, as could be understood. I mean, it does look in that picture there, although it's been cropped, it does look as though the, the Evan's got a, a young daughter there. So, um, for her sake, for the rest of the family, I hope he's he's found very soon. I hope it's just a, a case of having one too many and forgetting the way home. Yeah, it's happened uh, so many times, and it, there's a sense of relief where you get an update and everything's good and everything's fine. But if not, please get some information uh, to the police if you have it. Uh, we are talking about a generation of success. Colin, arguably, you've already had that, which is phenomenal in your lifetime. But the, the reason that we're bringing it up, there's been even further uh, reports in relation to the uh, financial health of Celtic Football Club and the fact that we are heading towards potentially having like record-breaking projections. And with regards to that, it's not one aspect of the business. You imagine the, the various different aspects of Celtic Football Club as a business and how that runs. We're interested mainly, obviously, on, on the football park and only if it's not going well do you start to strip back the layers. That might actually be... Uh, a slight air of complacency, by the way, uh, that you only concentrate on the football when things are good and then you look behind the scenes when things aren't so good. And we did that during the, the season that you've mentioned. And there's a few comments coming up that we'll bring up. But not only on the park, the management team's right, Colin. Uh, we've got the recruitment strategy spot on at this moment in time. It's it's working alongside the management team that we've got in place, headed by Ange. Uh, the money's in the bank. We've got assets on the, on the playing uh, field. We've got the stadium. You know, we're even talking about what you could do to improve the stadium. Um, and no one else within Scottish football is in such a fine standing. And what that then um, lends itself to is people saying, well, the Scottish game is, you know, boring. It's a one or two horse race. It's actually a one horse race a lot of the time, Colin, but people like to lump uh, it being a two horse race. Uh, what can Celtic do? They would never do anything down in England. And all these different conversations arise. There was talk last week again of, of another European Super League. Jim Moore has got very strong opinions on it. And um, if we do enter a period of generational domination, a lot of Celtic fans are quite happy with that in domestic football. Do you tend to then say, what else can we do here? What can we do in terms of Europe? Are you one of the fans that is always looking towards betting or bettering ourselves beyond the domestic game? Yeah, I mean, Europe is always the sort of milestone of where you sit across the, the sort of structure. And we talk about that Super League and how they even, they've spoke with the, the Scottish clubs, Scottish clubs being ourselves and, and Rangers, obviously. Um, and you've obviously got that thought back to the, 
the 67 team and the 70 team and teams that made semi-finals and stuff like that. And obviously football was very different back then, but the Scottish League held its own. It wasn't just Celtic, even though they were dominant. They won nine in a row during that period, but you had the likes of Dundee United making semi-finals, Rangers making finals, Aberdeen getting there, uh, Dunfermline did very well. There was a lot of strength within Scottish football. And obviously having not been there, and I know you were um, not there as well, see, uh, I'm not aging you that much. But you, you think back to what was done then, and all the other teams are trying to improve themselves. All the other teams are trying to get better. And what is the, the sort of the goal here in Scottish football? Do the other teams just wait for Celtic to have a bad season? Or do they try and improve themselves? Because I feel like there's an empathy towards the rest of Scottish football by the fans. It's like, well, there's this gap. What are we going to do? We're just going to need to accept it and move on. Mm-hmm. There's, there isn't this sort of mantra that, right, okay, this is a, the, the target that's been set. This is the standard that's been set for Celtic. Let's go and try and meet that. Be aspirational, as Anne just said. And I've got to say, for, for all the sort of the bad press, and as much as we, we don't like that team from across the city, when it came to pushing to stop 10 in a row, They spent the money, maybe they didn't have all the money to spend, but they made sure that they were better. When you look at it, they they were buying guys like Ryan Kent, they were spending the money to improve their team. They weren't relying on Celtic just having an off-season. They were buying guys to sort of get themselves up to that standard. And I I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, and you talk about um, Aberdeen. Now, Aberdeen have been trying to be the third force in Scottish football for a long, long time. Mm-hmm. And you take a look at the signings Jim Goodwin made in the summer. Guys like Anthony Stewart coming in, sort of a journeyman in English football, comes in and gets the, the captaincy right away. Now, what does that do for the rest of the standard of Scottish football? The rest of the standard of Scottish football generally is very, very poor. And a lot of that doesn't just come down to the gap in income. It comes down to the recruitment. The recruitment is terrible at times. You're right. What what was stopping, right, um, anybody looking at Matt O'Reilly? What was stopping anybody from tapping into a, a Japanese market, Colin, right, that proved when uh, Nakamura was at Celtic? And yes, I know we signed him from an Italian club, but I'm talking about the Japanese market. What was stopping any Scottish club from tapping into it? And it's, it's basically, it's a point that I've seen a few times. Celtic went there and made a success of it. Other teams could have done that. It's not like we were signing um, every player that, that Andrew signed um, for money that, that could not be raised by other clubs. Other clubs in Scottish football, Colin, as you've stated there, they have invested badly. I mean, I was just looking at Stuart, because you've mentioned him a couple of times, and I know that you um, have appeared fairly regularly on the uh, Red Tinted Specs podcast talking yep. to the, the Aberdeen fans about things like this. Anthony Stewart, uh, he's 30 years of age and he, and you can't just judge, I guess, um, a player by his previous clubs. I'd get that. But Wickham Wanderers, Crew Alexandra, Wickham Wanderers, Aberdeen. So you think to yourself, how aspirational is that sign? And not only are you bringing him in, you're then making him the captain. Um, why not push the boat out? Why not you know, invest in the recruitment structure that you've got so that when a player of Matt O'Reilly's talent becomes available for £1.5 million, and sp- instead of buying four journeyman players, Colin, you buy that one guy who actually might make a difference to your team. Yeah, and you take a look at it, you talk about the markets, now you're talking about the Japanese market. The, the market that's always been available to Scottish football um, and probably is not used as much as it could be is the Irish market. You take a look at some of the players that's came over from Ireland to the UK in the last 10, 15 years. Obviously, we, we, at Celtic, they've not been as successful. Um, but there is a market to, to tap into over there. You take a look at the likes of Bohemians who are pushing up toward the top of the, the Irish Premier League and some of the players that they've got over there. They're making the move over to English League One League uh, in the Championship. That's not out of the reach of Scottish football as long as they go and invest early. You take a look at the signings that St Mirren made uh, a couple of, was it last season, the season before? Um, 
you take a look at even the youth system in Scottish football. We, we look at these players that are moving on because they're not getting first-team football. The ones that we're actually brave enough to give an opportunity to, likes of Calvin Ramsey, likes of Aaron Hickey, the money that they will get, because let's be honest, Scotland is still a selling league. Mm-hmm. Even at Celtic, we're a selling league. But that money can be reinvested either in your youth system or look at the markets that are affordable to us. It's, it's it ties into that. It ties, it's ties into that. Yeah, it's I mean, an easy option to go down and get guys like Anthony Stewart and make him your captain right away. Well, Aberdeen, they had two big sales, didn't they? Because they, they sold Lewis Ferguson as well. Hibs have done the same. You know, and when you bring in that money, that that's when there is there is money available to go and buy the vast majority of the players uh, beyond, I would say, Starfelt, Kyogo, um, Yota, Kata Vickers. In terms of the financial makeup, maybe Juranovic, of a, a one to one and a half million pound player, and I know that you've got wages on top of this as, as well, Colin, but if you're selling a guy for three and a half or uh, million pounds, or they're going to Italy for a decent fee. Reinvest it properly because it's the basket case clubs. It's these ones that are swapping managers three times in a season, Colin, where there is no strategy. And, you know, Celtic shouldn't be criticised for having their strategy. You're going to be uh, talking about quite a few things today, but I'm going to lead this on to something you mentioned earlier. You mentioned the investment of. Um, Rangers to stop Celtic's 10 in a row. Yeah, you're right. They've, they've undoubtedly overstretched and that is part of Celtic's domination right now as well because they won't be able to come back uh, in a transfer window and compete with Celtic. And one of the things they did, of course, a couple of seasons before they eventually won a league was um, they appointed Stevie Gerrard. And I, I think that we shouldn't be surprised um, about the fact that Stevie Gerrard always wanted to celebrate a goal in front of the Celtic fans because we know deep down he is a Celtic fan at heart, Colin. And that's the reason why he was so delighted to run up to the Celtic fans. It made a lot of uh, headlines over the weekend there. Um, and it was interesting, the narrative that people were painting on that. But we know because Andy Lynch told us that Stephen Gerrard was a Celtic fan. And when Andy was doing a Liverpool, Gerrard came up to him um, and wanted to talk about Celtic, said that that had been his team, you know, that had been his Scottish team growing up, Colin. And he even had a Celtic jersey up on his up, up on his wall of his house, and it had Simon Lynch's name and number on the back of it from the Ronnie Moran testimonial. Um, so we know that that's why he wanted to celebrate in front of the Celtic fans. And by the way, you know, the the, the headlines around that there was one particular website. I'm not even going to name the news source. There must have been five or six headlines, and the narrative was all bad Celtic fans and all this kind of stuff. Honestly, how to paint a narrative? There's four and a half thousand Celtic fans travel down to Liverpool to raise money for charity. You know, it's a charity game where you've got old guys with bellies hanging over their shorts, a lot of them calling, right? But Celtic fans have put their hands in their hands in their pockets, hands in their pockets again to raise money for charity. And then the narrative is, oh, let's no, let's not look at that side of it. Let's try and make a, a a narrative that Celtic fans are bad. Well, I'm not having that. Um, and I wasn't at the game. I had a couple of events over the weekend. You weren't at the game. And I hope everybody that did travel down had a fantastic weekend. Let's not try and create the narrative that Celtic and Liverpool don't have a great history together, both as fans and as football clubs, Colin. Absolutely. And I've got to say, I've, I think I've mentioned it before, Liverpool would be what I'd class as my English team. Um, I've been down to Anfield before. I was lucky to to get along to a game. Um, the stadium is fantastic. The support are brilliant. Um, the, the whole thing with Gerard, it's like, Gerard was a, a world-class footballer. There's nothing that you can say that would change anybody's opinion on that. He was a world-class footballer. Um, he's He walked his way into a job at Ibrox, and even as a Celtic man, if, if that's what he is, like, there's no way you can not try and endeavour yourself to the, the team that you're that are basically paying your wages and you could see with this kind of sort of smile on his face he knew what he was doing there's nothing sinister about what he'd done um was I very annoyed when he took the Rangers job of course I was um he knew what he was doing he was getting himself into management for him it was a job we know exactly everything that's happened since I just find it hilarious that scoring in a charity game 
takes you from a snake back to a god. That that just amazes me, to be perfectly honest. By the way, Robbie Keane should have scored uh, that header in the first half. Um, and, and it was never a penalty. Darren O'Day, I mean, it was a perfectly timed tackle, by the way. And I don't know if it went too far, but Darren was gutted. You could tell on his face. He was absolutely gutted. Um, but these things happen in charity games and testimonials. Joe Hamilton is watching from Austria. Um, thanks for tuning in, Joe. It's always an absolute pleasure to see uh, where our viewers are tuning in from. And we've also got, like Colin said earlier, Xander Mack tuning in from sunny Fort William. Um, and we've got a few other really good points coming in that I'm going to be raising in relation to the makeup of Celtic Football Club. Keith Oakton uh, from Plymouth, hail, hail to you as well. Yeah. Urban Culture comes in, first of all, still strongly believe, this is what I was talking about earlier, Colin, when things are good sometimes, you know, you don't look beyond the fact that we're, we're doing well on the park. But Urban Culture strongly believes that we need a clear out of dead wood on that board and new dynamic people brought in. That was the argument that we were having. That's the argument that, that Kevin Graham would still pose as well, Colin. But as football fans, it's almost natural for us to to stop looking too deeply into that when things are so good. Yeah, it is. It's one of those things that's like the success sort of covers up the, the patches of the anger at, that fans had when things weren't going too well. And I, I still do think there's there's things that Celtic um, do behind the scenes that not everybody agrees with. I mean, you take a look at this kit that I'm wearing just now, this fourth kit. We're speaking about releasing a fourth kit in the, the cost of living crisis. Um, some fans are against that. Fans are against the, the ticket prices. There's a lot of things behind the scenes, and Celtic's not the perfect club. But what they do have is they have someone in Ange Postacoglu who can, that is relatable mm -hmm. to the Celtic fans who has a very strong um, relationship with the fans. And if you take a look at it, there's probably a lot of other managers who could have come into this role that would have done maybe as good a job as what Ange Postacoglu has done, but they wouldn't have got that relationship with the fan base. They wouldn't have got that enamour that Celtic have to their manager. Mm. And that helps when there's things behind the scenes that we don't agree with. Because you go to the game on the Saturday or the Sunday and everybody's happy as Larry again. And it is sort of a naivety to forget things like that. We take a look at this thing that's going on behind the scenes at the minute about the Celtic end. Now, in general, there's it's probably a good idea. I mean, it would be great for the atmosphere at Celtic Park, I think, to have a, a bigger sort of singing section to an extent and including that standing section in there as well. But then... There's a lot of opposition against it from people that are in that section that have sat there um, for years. Mm. And if that was to ever come to head, there would be big arguments across the whole Celtic fan base. I think the fan base would be very, very split on it. But you don't really hear a lot about it at the minute because Celtic's doing well and Celtic are successful in the park and there's a manager that everyone loves in Ange Postacoglu. So it, right. it does sort of cover a lot of things up. There is things that Celtic can do a lot, lot better. But everybody's living and enjoying the moment at the minute. Yeah, and you've, it's important to do that um, as well. Uh, and, you know, we were the uh, we were the ones that were saying that people were sleeping at the wheel, etc. And that's true. That is true. That that There was a complacency around us not completing the job. And the job was to get 10 in a row at that point. Um, at this moment in time, I don't... You know, feel like always talking about the board at this moment, but that's that's natural, that's understandable, and that's because the team is doing so well, I and mean, everything at the club is rosy and positive. So that even when it's something like Celtic releasing a fourth kit, which incidentally would have been part of their deal, maybe twice out of their deal with Adidas, they'll release four kits, and every other season they'll release three. Who knows what the deal is? I'd need to double check it. Uh, but because things are going well, you imagine that happened and things weren't going so well. Yeah. The you know the influx of absolute negativity, even just on social media, uh, would be palpable. Uh, loads more to talk about here. And David Boyle, this leads me on to something I'm going to throw in here. Um, this is a good point. Hopefully, Ange has been given full reign on implementing the structure required to identify and recruit young uh, prospected or prospects rather continuously in order to be able to compete yearly in Europe. Right. And I think this is a two-pronged thing. Obviously, you get the recruitment right, and that's dead important. 
Um, but for years and for generations, Celtic, um, you know, got the youth development aspect right as well, Colin. And I'm talking way back. I'm talking the Kelly kids, the Lisbon Lions, the Quality Street gang. And then you move into the um, era of producing players like Tommy Burns and Roy Aiken. Um, and then after that, you had Paul McStay, our guest the other night, Peter Grant. There was, mm-hmm. a, there was, you know, a conveyor belt of young talent coming through. And I think that what then happened was in the 90s, it dried up a great deal. Um, whereby we didn't have the same kind of assets that pr- previously we did. So back at right back in the day, uh, we needed to install floodlights. So we sold a player, and the player that we sold was Willie Fernie to, to install floodlights. Um, 1960s, we had to sell a player. Who do we sell? Paddy Crer and somebody that came through the ranks. And that happened throughout. About the only period where uh, someone was in full control was was Jock Steen and the team that was never really sold when they were at their peak was the Lisbon Lions but yeah. the 70s changed that uh, because the, the change in board uh, and the, the view of the board Sir Robert Kelly was no longer there we did start selling our prized assets again that happened with the Quality Street Gang and it's never really stopped but one thing um, that has changed is we're we're selling players that we've bought in rather than reared through the academy system. But obviously there is this new proposal and Celtic seem to be leading the way. It's going to cost Celtic a six-figure sum every single year uh, to implement this conference league, which will sit under the four SPFL divisions, Colin. Um, And the reason that they're doing it is because at this moment in time, the B teams are basically stagnating within a division. We can't get out of that division. And if it goes to the big vote, we'll never get out of the division because people don't want us to progress through the through the leagues and through the channels. Um, everybody seems to be looking after their own interests. Um, I would much rather we did what was right for youth development. So surely youth development is that they can play at a higher level. And if Celtic can continue to progress through the pyramid system, then your young talent will play at a higher level, which means mm-hmm. that if you're calling on a player, and I've just spoken about this, if you're calling on a young player right now to make the step up, you're asking them to step up five from tier five to tier one, too big a step up. Mm-hmm. And what Celtic are obviously looking at is that you know we could get a situation where we're calling on somebody to, to step up from the championship eventually to the premiership. And that is going to be a much smaller gap than youth football or fifth tier football to the first team. I think it's a positive. A lot of people out there will say you're just looking after your own interests. I would much rather we produced better young talent, Colin, who could come into the first team. And I think this is, for me, this is a way of doing it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the proposal will go ahead. Um, it sounds as if it doesn't need any uh, backing from the rest of the teams in the league. It's something they can do because it would be a, an independent body. Um when you look at it just now, Ange keeps going on about how players are six to 12 months away from being available to make that step up to the first team. And if you look at the, the fixtures that the B team do just now, um, probably some of their most competitive fixtures is when they go down south mm. and play in the um, Premier League Cup or whatever it's called. Um, and also when they play in the Glasgow Cup because they play against senior teams from... League One, League Two, like it's a Clyde, uh, I think Partick Thistle, Queen's Park. There's a couple of other teams in there. Um, and it's not necessarily the first team that they're playing, but there's a, a mix of first team players in there, the way that the old reserve league used to be. Um, and whilst there's no, there's no sort of um, encouragement for that reserve league to come back, there's no appetite for it, then something has to be done. Because we are losing a generation of young players. You take a look at it now and you, you, you speak about the young players that used to come through. And it was because they'd impressed in training. It's because they'd impressed in friendlies, things like that. Now, when a youth player comes through, it's almost as if it's a necessity. Like Kieran Tierney was thrown into the team, because, not because he was the, the best young left-back coming through at Celtic Park. He was actually left behind from a reserve game and uh, Ronnie Dyla needed a left-back to join in the training. Mm-hmm. He was the third-choice left-back at the time and he took his opportunity. And these kids don't get the opportunity now to come through. You take a look at ones that's moved on to Bayern Munich, that's moved down south. Look at 
Ben Doak, and I hope he's actually doing quite well because that looked a, a very sore knock that he took in the UEFA uh, Youth League game. But guys like that, they didn't really get that time at Celtic. Ben Doak came on for, what was it, six minutes against Rangers. Uh, ben Summers was on the bench against mm-hmm. Hibs. It's a great experience for them, but they need to be fully integrated and it just doesn't happen anymore. Now you're lucky if in a decade you bring through one or two players that become mainstays in your team. And that was unheard of back in the sort of 60s, 70s and 80s. See, the thing you mentioned a few there, um, the others obviously who are in the team, in the squad at this moment in time, are the captain, Callum McGregor, who I want to talk about, James Forrest, who's had a sterling career uh, at Celtic, Tony Ralston, uh, Stephen Welsh, and of course, uh, some of the guys that are on loan, like Mikey Johnson. They've come through the ranks, Colin, but um, look at their age group. Where, where's the 18, 19, 20, 21, 22-year-olds? They're not there, so you're right. Mm-hmm. For seasons and seasons, we've not had it coming through uh, with the regularity that it, it needs to uh, it needs to happen. The reserve league, losing the reserve league was massive. Everybody um, focused on academy football uh, in Scotland. I've spoken to a lot of people who are involved in that. I think there's pros and cons, but we certainly do need to have the competitive edge between being a youth footballer, playing against guys the same age as you, and then coming into a first-team environment where you need to win every single game for Celtic Football Club. Now, that mentality and that culture, you've lived it. You you know, when you think about a player um, who's been at the club since they were you know, 10-year-old or whatever it may be, sometimes younger. Um, I mean, Ben Summers, he'd been at the club 11 years. Mm-hmm. He's 18. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you've got, you know what it, what it means to play for Celtic. You know what the expectations are. Um, but have you been playing at a high enough level to make that step up? And a lot of the time, that's where it breaks down. So I think it's a positive. There's going to be other clubs who completely disagree clubs who are already in the pyramid system, lowland league clubs who won't like it. They didn't like the B teams going in. But you know what? My priority is Celtic and the, the development of our own youth. It costs, what, two and a half million a year to run yeah. our academy, Colin? So even on a financial level, you know, you never ever want a club to look at it. And clubs have looked at it. Big clubs have looked at it and says, actually, that's a business, uh, you know, that's a business cost we don't need because it's not paying back. We never, ever want to get to that point. We want to be able to produce youth footballers, both to play for Celtic and potentially to make to make funds and make money for Celtic. And see, when you look at it in general, the Lowland League is something that came into the place two or three other different leagues. So it was a change in the pyramid system. Opening mm-hmm. up the pyramid system to get these teams to come through, there's always got to be that sort of how can we improve Scottish football for the better instead of just saying, oh, these teams are just doing it to better themselves? Now, play, you, you hear fans saying, well, you only get two, 300 fans at the Excelsior Stadium when Celtic are playing, or you only get this, that, and it's not going to be big amounts of fans. Right, that's, I understand that, and I understand that element to it. There's a couple of things that Celtic could do a lot better to promote the B team, Mm -hmm. um, to get a bigger crowd at the games. There's certainly work that Celtic could do. But these players that are coming up against what are arguably going to be the future youth prospects for their national teams, or if they get that experience, can move into the first teams, that must be a benefit for them as well. Because they're testing themselves at a better level. And you see that these players that are shining in the Lowland League, they're moving up. They're playing in League One, League Two, Championship football. Who was actually going to take a look at look at them if they weren't there? If Celtic and Rangers and Harps B teams weren't there, who's yeah. actually paying attention to them? So, yes, there's positives and negatives to it. And you take a look at the argued failure of Open Goal Broom Hill and the investment that was put in there, they think it was a success. A lot of fans see it as a failure. How, how was it a success? Well, the, the club have come out and said it was a commercial success. Right. It says that they've generated a lot of income. They've obviously opened the club up to a lot of new eyes. They had a, a solid fan base there. I think they had 1,500 at a um, Scottish Cup tie, which was probably unheard of right. for them. Right. Uh, they've got a new stadium, things like that. How did they do on the park? There's a couple of points off the bottom 
spots. Simon Ferry obviously brought in guys like Cut Broadfoot and brought in guys from the Championship League, One League Two, and it didn't work for them. So it does show that the standard of football down there is semi decent. Um, and you've got to have the right structure behind you to do well in that league. So whilst Celtic and Rangers are towards the top of that league, surely it shows that they're a benefit to having them there. I do feel, by the way, on the Broom Hill thing, that uh, Simon Ferry's getting a wee bit too much stick around that because um, people are sticking on comments that he made when he took the job. Right. I mean, you could do that to just about any manager in their yeah. career. Yeah. If things, you know, if things don't work out the way you as an individual hope they might work out, if things don't work out the way that open goal was, was hoping it would work out, you know, you make the change. You, I, I don't think you can vilify the guy for it. He's a good guy. He's 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 a professional. Uh, and, and two different walks of life, both with the, the media side of it and the football side of it. And I just felt, I've seen a lot of stuff that was a bit unfair calling, a bit OTT, uh, give him a break, you know what I mean? So Keith Oakden, I've worked from home since the lockdown and I can tell you actually still makes a difference. Thank you for sharing that, Keith, because it makes a difference to us as well, Colin. Um, I want to talk about Callum McGregor. You mentioned the, you know, the, the well-told tale of Kieran Tierney and that sliding doors moment and the fact that, you know, as they say, the rest is history. Callum McGregor, um, you know, took him a long time to get into the side yep. and establish himself at Celtic. And as a result of that, his international career was probably a wee bit later in coming yep. than would have expected. I was looking with interest at the fact that he's he won his 50th cap there against Cyprus. Uh, des- deservingly so. He's been very consistent for a number of mm-hmm. campaigns in, in Scotland's uh, team. Last week we were hearing John Carver calling him a coach on the pitch. Andy Robertson says that his attitude to football is second to none. We know that as Celtic supporters. But I found it interesting that he only made his international debut in 2017, Colin, uh, going on to win 50 caps basically in a seven-year period. Um, uh, sorry, in a, in a six-year period or, or five, if you look at the fact that this is his first cap of 2023. If he continues on um, what he's doing right now, I'm going to ask you a question. Could Callum McGregor play um, at this level, a la Scott Brown, captain Celtic, play for Scotland until he's 35? Do you think? Yeah. You think he could? I think he yeah. could. I think he's that type of player that he's, he's like supremely fit. You can mm-hmm. tell that he is supremely fit. You can tell that the, the you know the, the work he puts into any single game, Colin, you would need to be at the peak fitness. Um, he has had some pretty serious injuries and uh, either played through them, you know, with a face mask or, you know, played, it got back really, really quickly. That, you know, it would have taken players a long, long time to come back from them. He plays a lot of games. We all know how many minutes he plays. If he was to play until he's 35 at this rate, he'd win 100 caps. That's frightening. And he's one of those players that he always wants to play, he loves the game of football. Absolutely loves it. And you can tell when he's out, he hates being out. He doesn't want to be rested. He's a guy that wants to play, he wants to lead by example. And there's a lot to be said about that because not many footballers are actually like that. As much as some of them say, I love playing the game, they're like, oh, I need a wee break here. I'm maybe retire from international football at 30. I'll, I, I need a couple of weeks out. I'm burnt out. You never ever hear that from a guy like Callum McGregor. It's almost as if it's like a pleasure for him to get on and he understands that there's thousands of people that sit in the stands week in, week out that would love to be in his position and he embraces it. Now, we had this sort of discussion, maybe not last season, the season before, about what would it be like when Callum McGregor stepped up and became captain because there was a lot of uncertainty about it. People weren't sure about his his attitude towards it. Uh, and what he would, his impact on the, the club would be. And it's, looking back on it in hindsight, how stupid were we? Like, generally, to, to even think that, it was never a question, really. But the, the, the impact that Callum McGregor has, not just on the Celtic team, but on his national team, is unbelievable. And I think he'll reach 100 caps within the next three or four years, easily. Because Scotland play an obscene amount of international games now. They've obviously got playoffs, they're getting towards major tournaments. I think he'll happily be there for the next three, four years, and in that time, make 100 caps quite easily. 
you know what I love, Colin, right? It, on this show is if you make a wee faux pas, yeah, it could be a technical glitch or it could be an admission that you, you secretly love wet, wet, wet. It could be anything. If you make a wee faux pas, it's brilliant how the people that watch just let you get over that and just ignore keep, that it happened. Eh? Keep, keep you humble, don't they? The, the, absolutely. Yeah. Cheers, Johnny. Uh, keeping us humble day by day. You know, and I've said this before, only in the last 12 months have I got internet banking. Right, I'm like your your old uncle that honestly struggles to tie shoelaces at times. Right, see when I was at the uh, Barra's Art and Design the other night, brilliant mm-hmm. venue, and that's that's where we do our events, by the way. Um, and on Friday night we did an event with Alan McGee, and Alan McGee discovered, um, released or managed uh, such bands as Oasis, The Jesus and Mary Chain, My Bloody Valentine. Primal Scream, Teenage Fan Club, Ride, Super Furry Animals, Saint Etienne, oh, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, Kevin Rowland. And um, our pal, Simon Weir, Celtic fan Simon Weir, um, actor, uh, came along to the gig. And just before we went in, we went outside because he has opened up, um, or resurrected rather, his old fashion line, um, Zico. Well named Zico, right? So I'm going to tell you, go and visit him Saturday and Sunday. He's at B56, which is his pitch on Monker Street, um, just in the the heart of the Barras, from ten to four on a Saturday and Sunday. Go and say hello to Simon, and um, aye, see maybe that you'll be able to buy some Axum gear out of there at some point as well. So it's a resurrection of a Brazilian legend in Zico. And uh, we go from that to a Brazilian dance in Sambas. Colin, what's your take? You've already said that there won't be Celtic Dars. Well, I'm a Celtic Dar and I'm not wearing them. But I already know at least two members of the Axrom team have got or ordered a pair. Are you one of them? No. Um, they are very popular from what I've been told. Um, supplies are getting very limited. But do you know what? It's... From what I understand, it shows how much Adidas rate the partnership with Celtic. And it's not the first time that a, a brand has bought out Celtic trainers. I think there was there was a three different trainers that were brought out by New Balance. Um, I thought you were going to say hits. I thought you were going to say hits with a Z back in the 80s. They were the ones that uh, they did Man United, Celtic, and they also did Rangers back then as well. Yeah, I was I was definitely there in the 80s. Um, <laughs> the New Balance obviously brought out trainers and you take a look at the other teams across uh, the UK, especially Liverpool, Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea, Spurs, the teams that have massive superstores, they have uh, really good connections with their shirt manufacturers. Liverpool just brought out about three, four months ago um, a pair of trainers that was a collaboration between Nike and themselves, and it was mm. the LeBron James collection. Oh, sure. And they went for about, what, £150 or something like that. Um, you can get them on StockX for about 160 180 just now. That's so weird. for shoe collectors, it's it's a dream to see things like that. I, don't get me wrong, I, I really like my trainers as well. Um, but the Sambas, for me, they're just the original five-a-side trainer. And I don't know if I would wear a pair of them to five sides just now because uh, you wouldn't want to get them like sort of dirty or anything like that. It's... I know, I know. But they went from that to a kind of fashion trainer, like yeah. almost like that ironic thing where like punk bands wearing tight black jeans were, were wearing a pair of Adidas Sambas, uh, classic Sambas. So, yeah, they've gone through that whole journey and now obviously there's, there's the Celtic ones. We probably should have done a deal with Champion, remember them? They've yeah. done some cool green trainers back in the day. Um, they're, still but yeah, they're still around. They're quite popular now. They came back. They did, aye. Yeah. I mean, they might never have gone away, actually. But I remember them kind of coming to the UK back in maybe the 90s. Um, and then they disappeared for a while. But I've seen them kicking about uh, since then. Um, with a lot younger people than me wearing it. Hoops Boy. Anyone got to repeat a Grant Q&A? Was it good? Um, there's a couple of things I want to mention about that, right? 
not because it's blatant self-promotion, it's something that's happened. But the reason we do the events is because we want to keep our um, content free charge at all times. I know that some people build something and do a little Patreon or put it behind a paywall and stuff like that. We want to do more content uh, on our YouTube channel and elsewhere. Um, so we do some live events and that allows us to, to meet people and uh, we try and keep them as affordable as possible, uh, Colin. So Peter Grant comes along. And as I said earlier, he almost played with Chris Sutton at Norwich. So here's a couple of wee um, takeaways. Uh, Peter Grant spoke about Love Street. He was on the bench when we beat St Mirren 5 nothing. came on for Danny McGrain. And what did he do after it? He went to a CSC event in Oban after it with Paul McGugan. Now, compare that to modern footballers, Colin, where, you know, you just don't get near them. He went to a CSC event and celebrated without drinking with the fans that night. Unbelievable. I think the last question that was asked in the evening is what does Celtic mean to you? And he said everything. And he meant it. You could tell he meant it. Mm -hmm. It was like a tear in his eye. Love Celtic. Um, it tells us some brilliant stuff. I'm not going to ruin it because I'm pretty sure he'll, he'll come to a CSC near you soon. Um, he should anyway. He was absolutely fantastic. But he tells the story of him and Mowbray coming to Celtic, which I found really, really interesting, Colin. Um, as to the inner workings of the football club at that particular time. Um, quite a lot of things that we probably thought was going on, was going on. I, I pitched up with the um, the view that they had they had bought Danny Fox, remember the left back? And um, they started giving Donati a game and Donati uh, became a right good player for them. And both, both players were were seemingly sold from under their nose um, as well. So there was obviously issues uh, that was going. And... Um, And obviously, with regards to the uh, Di Canio affair as well, he shared a room with Paolo Di Canio, who um, put a fish in his bed. You've heard of the, the mafia putting a horse's head in your bed. Well, Di Canio put a shark's head in Peter Grant's bed, and the rumour was that Grant had a fish phobia. And that started from Di Canio writing an autobiography, by which time he had long since left Celtic and that was it. People were coming to games, opposition fans were coming to games with fish on their head, uh, as you do. He also spoke about the guy that we call Le Petit Merd. I think you all know who we're talking about, who decided to do the unthinkable. Um, and he told us that he didn't speak to him for five years. He sat next to him on the Celtic bus going to the 1989 Scottish Cup final against Rangers, Colin. Peter Grant sat next to him on the bus. He was on the Celtic bus. Um, unbelievable story. Uh, obviously, 1995, he should never have played because he was injured. He played through the pain barrier. The tears at the end of the game weren't just for himself. They were for Tommy. They were for Paul McStay, who'd missed the penalty against Wraith Rovers. What a guest. He also spoke about the fact he was offered a two-year deal by Vim Janssen to stay, mm -hmm. but he realised at that point, his words, he wasn't good enough for Celtic to progress, so he left. Unbelievable guy. What a it's what a what a what a guy! It's quite interesting that because we go back to a couple of weeks to another event that's coming up, obviously for the foundation with Scott Brown and Mika Lustig, um, and Scott Brown mentioned basically the exact same thing about how he was offered a, a new deal to stay at Celtic under Ange and realised that it was time for him to move on as well, and it takes a certain type of person to understand that. Um, and fair play to, to Grant here. I know um, everybody that I've heard that was at the event really enjoyed themselves um, and hopefully he continues on the circuit because I'm sure he's got some really good stories to tell. It's one of the ones where he's been in football so long post-playing. You know, he's, he's had coaching careers, managerial positions, assistant manager positions um, that I don't think we've had the opportunity to hear a lot of his tales, Colin. He's never written a book. Um, he wasn't really doing much media. He started getting into that a wee bit now. Uh, but seriously, as Lawrence Conley said, he was outstanding. And by the way, stepping in at the last minute to do it um, shows you the type of guy he is. He was brilliant. He had a very good um, chin wag afterwards as well. Pete McGee, yeah, great player, De Canio, but pff, the dodgiest politics you could imagine. Um, proper hardcore as well. Do, do you know, it's, was any of it recorded? No. Well, <laughs> actually... It was. The full show was recorded. Ah. So what to do um, is to keep an eye on Gracie's social media channels because the whole show was recorded 
Um, I, I mean, that happened when we turned up. That that was happening. It's, it, we didn't organise that. Uh-huh. But um, I, if you want to catch up, get on to Gracie's uh, social media channels. Do you know, I'd be quite interested, obviously, um, Axom's been running on this sort of platform now for, what, three, three and a bit years, maybe? On YouTube, yep. Aye. Yeah, three and a bit years. I'd be interested to know what the, the people that watch every day would think about having some sort of system, maybe like a membership thing where... Um, people can watch these clips, see the, the sort of things that we, we don't post every single day, um, obviously keeping the the um, the bulletin running out as regular, but having additional acts on content, um, things like I, I noticed and I, I've still to catch up on them, but i seen Scream was back. It's back. Um, and of the specials. Some, yeah, some, some really good albums that were um, looked at, so there's a lot of great content that we still have in the, the archives that could be put out there, Paul. I just wonder if people would be interested seeing that, um, even if it was a sort of membership thing that they, we, we set up. Well, you, you think about uh, a Celtic event that we maybe do, right? So if we go to Barra's Art and Design, you're going to get 300 people in to, to hear Martin O'Neill, right? Which was a tremendous night. Or maybe in a kind of more pub setting like Gracie's, about 170 people in the, in the room. Um, and we could live stream them. We, mm-hmm. We've got the we've got the technology to live stream the events, you know. So we could put it out there. And there's going to be obviously a lot of people out there who can't get to Glasgow for obvious reasons that might want to watch it. So let us know if you would be up for that. Um, we haven't had any update as far as I know on um, Evan, our missing person. So hopefully he will be found soon. I was just going to check my phone there, but. Um, as someone said, ah, I'm the dotary member of Axel. I've lost my phone. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where it is. Right. So hopefully he will be found. Um, another thing I just want to pitch uh, as well go and visit Zico's, was my message earlier on. Go and visit Simon at Zico's. But uh, we were handed some of these flyers. Let me put this back so you can see it. Handed some of these flyers there on Friday night as well. And um, this is an event that's happening on the 90th of September. We're not involved in it. We just think it's a great event and we'd love to go along and maybe you will as well. It's uh, Love Glasgow, Hate Racism. And it's actually taking place at the iconic Barrowland Ballroom, headlined by our pals, The Wakes. Uh, Go along, there's four bands and all proceeds go to the Scottish Refugee Council. So there you go. I'm pretty sure there's a few of you who would enjoy that. I'll definitely be going along. One of the, the... most bizarre thing, seeing how we've been in a mood of dropping names, Colin, today. I think you might have started it. Um, I probably did. <laughs> On Friday night, um, we, were, we were just obviously lapping up the fact that Alan McGee was in the room, but there's a, there's a crack in me backstage area, and in the backstage were Bobby Bluebell from the Bluebells and uh, Johnny McElhone from Texas. So you mm-hmm. sometimes look at that and go, how did this happen? Last month it was Las Vegas with Martin O'Neill. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Celtic fans. It's just brilliant. I love it. I love to see it. And it just shows the the kind of talent because Bobby and Johnny are also big Celtic fans as well. So it was a fantastic night. Um, and I loved every single moment of it. If you want to get involved in something like that, uh, next up is Alan Thompson. Alan Thompson's coming to... Uh, Gracie's with a Celtic state of mind. We're going to be talking in the 20th anniversary of Seville, that run to Seville, everything that happened during his playing career under Martin O'Neill and Gordon Strachan, uh, and also when he came back as part of Neil Lennon's team as well. Um, every single thing, and as you know, no holds barred with Tomo. He will tell the tales, he'll answer your questions, and uh, we're really looking forward to Alan Thompson coming to a Celtic state of mind. I would say there's only a few tickets left for that one, but if you want to come along, it's 15 quid, and the ticket link is underneath this video. Um, I really mean what I said when I opened this up. Uh, Axom, the, the team really appreciates everybody tuning in, and when you get a wee gift uh, randomly from someone who tunes in, it means a hell of a lot, but it means a lot to us as well. So thank you very much for tuning in. All that's left for me to say, Colin Watt, thank you for oh, joining oh, me. Oh, Paul, Paul, we can. There's What's one happening? more thing we have to say. Okay, okay what have I missed? It's Glasgow Derby Night. It's live on BBC. Alaba, mm. Celtic versus Rangers. Come on, the girls in green. Sticking a couple past them. Great results against them so far this season. Let's put another W in the books. 
No, but thank you for that. Thanks for reminding me. Uh, so we're six points behind with 10 to go. Yeah. Right? Yep. So um, winning tonight, it's it's about momentum as well, isn't it? To try and get you know that momentum going for the last 10 games. Can we do it? Can Fran can. and the girls do it? Of course we can. There you go. I know you're a big fan. Um, and if you want to tune in, if you've never tuned in before, well, it's involved. on Sky tonight. It's not on BBC Alba. On Sky. On Sky. You know, it's one of the things we've covered quite a few of the, the women's games um, and we will do so in the future again. So enjoy it or get along and, and see the girls as well. And hopefully they can claw back those six points. It has been an absolute delight again on a Monday to speak to you, Colin. Thank you very much for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind. <laughs>